Okay, uh, you know all these people, but uh, uh, our first speaker will be uh, Brett Batterson, who is the uh, executive director, is that the title they gave you? That is. Of the Auditorium Theater, and a man who uh, actually has uh, informed me who Patty Lapone is, and, and I saw her, and now I know, so I'm an expert. Uh, uh, who knew? Anyways, round of applause for our pal, Brett Batterson, Roosevelt University Auditorium Theater. Next, you all know Blair Kamen, the, uh, uh, who once called himself the architectural activist, and I accidentally introduced him one time as the architectural anarchist. I hope you don't, <laughs> hope you don't remember that one. Pulitzer Prize winner, it's the Chicago Tribune. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> and of course, Rick Kogan, uh, man about town, uh, radio, newspapers. I'm bo for mayor. Bo <laughs> Tad Late. Bon vivant, and of course, uh, uh, his dad was part of the two of the best books ever written on Chicago politics. So how about a big round of applause for Rick Hogan. <laughs> so if our little French guy, all right, our, one of our students is there, direct from Paris, international, as you all know, the City Club. Uh, first up, Brett Batterson, you want to come to the, uh, sure. all right. Go right ahead, you're on. Thank you, Professor Green. Um, I'd like to uh, recognize a bunch of friends in the room, but two in particular because they're my bosses, and you always have to do that. Uh, I want to recognize the president of Roosevelt University, Chuck Middleton. <laughs> and the chairman of the auditorium board for uh, about 13 years, Mel Catton. So as Paul said, I have the great privilege to be the executive director of the Auditorium Theater of Roosevelt University. And believe me, every single day I realize what a great privilege that is. And I'm humbled and honored to stand before you today, um, along with these two esteemed gentlemen. And I want to give a little um, uh, warning, if you will, before I begin. If I say anything that either of these two say differently, believe them. <laughs> because one has been in Chicago forever, and the other one is a Pulitzer Prize winner. So believe them, don't believe me. Uh, I'm going to talk about the auditorium's uh, human aspect, if you will, from the people side. And Blair's then is going to talk about the architecture, and then Rick's going to bring us home with some uh, charming stories and Chicago history um, to share with us. So. The Auditorium Theater just celebrated 125 years on December 9th. So who knows then the year we opened? This is a math test. 1889, December 9th, 1889 was the official opening. However, what's not known is that we actually held an event before that because Ferdinand Peck, who uh, Blair will tell you about, who decided to build the auditorium, committed that we would hold the Republican National Convention in 1888, and of course the building wasn't quite done. So if you look at this photo, you'll see there's no ceiling and the grand arches aren't there. So in 1888, the first event was held at the auditorium and they put a canvas tent over the roof and shoved all, I don't know, 6,000 Republicans into the room to nominate their nominee for president that year. Then on December 9th, 1889, we actually opened. And it was a grand night. It was the biggest thing that had happened in Chicago since the fire. And it really, really uh, made a huge impression around the world. Um, the president and the vice president of the United States were both there. It was the first time that they had both left Washington at the same time while Congress was in session. And two weeks after they saw the opening of the auditorium is when they voted to give the World's Fair, the 1893 World's Fair, to Chicago. So we take all the credit. <laughs> Just so you know. Uh, Adelina Patti was the star that night. Adelina Patti was the leading soprano of the day. And um, we have Patti the Divine, so Patti Eiler over here who spells her name with an I is very happy to see the headline. Uh, Adelina Patti came and sang. Uh, the president spoke, the mayor spoke, the governor spoke. It was really a, a terrific, terrific night. And it kicked the auditorium off in the way that a building of that grandeur should, um, should be celebrated. The auditorium was originally built to house opera and symphony. The uh, city of Chicago did not have resident companies at the time, but with the building of the auditorium, Theodore Thomas was able to found what became the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, 
and opera was created, which eventually led to the founding of the Lyric Opera of Chicago. So both of those started at the Auditorium Theater. We also held other shows in our first 40 or 50 years of history. Um, for instance, we had uh, the Ziegfeld Follies, which you'll see coming up. And uh, the final show was uh, Hell's a Poppin' before the theater closed for good. Now, let me tell you why that happened. Um, the auditorium building, when it was built, was, and I think Blair's gonna touch on this, um, the first multi-purpose building ever built in the world. And they built this grand theater in the center and then surrounded it with a hotel in an in office tower with the ideas that the joint revenues would support the whole enterprise. Well, the uh, uh, hotel was built with shared restrooms. So soon after it opened, they started building hotels with private restrooms in each room. So it started going downhill. And the office tower, like all office towers, was soon replaced by newer, better office towers. So in fact, the theater carried the hotel and the office tower until the whole enterprise shut down just, uh, just before the war, well, actually at the beginning of the war, in 1941. So in 1942, the city of Chicago took over the auditorium building for back taxes and created the Chicago Servicemen's Center. You will often hear that the auditorium was a USO, and it actually wasn't. The USO was a federal program, and this was a city of Chicago program. Otherwise, it was very similar, and all soldiers and sailors that came through the auditorium building could be from anywhere in the world, but it was a city, CS, uh, a city USO type organization. So they held dances, they actually had bowling on our stage. They turned the auditorium stage into a bowling alley. And we still have veterans that we talk to that remember bowling on the auditorium stage. We're actually, as part of our 125th celebration, uh, recording their memories to, um, to you know, put down for posterity because there aren't too many of those guys left. But this is an example of the bowling on the auditorium stage. Um, and then, at the end of the war, the city had this huge building. And there was um, a university in Chicago called uh, the YMCA College of Chicago. And like most universities at the time, they had a strict quota of the numbers of blacks and Jews that they would allow into their college. And as the war ended, and all of these uh, soldiers came back, the board of the YMCA College told its president, Edward J. Sparling, that he had to maintain that quota. He refused to do so and was fired. The next day, the entire faculty, except for one, quit in support of Dr. Sparling. And the day after that, the entire student body quit. So in three days, the YMCA College went out of business. <laughs> and the brave Dr. Sparling had a faculty and a student body behind him and no university. So they started what they called Thomas Jefferson College in, uh, I think it was five days after they started it, uh, Franklin Roosevelt died. So Dr. Sparling wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt and said that this is what we're doing. We're starting a university that will accept all academically qualified students regardless of race, color, creed. And we'd like to name it after Franklin. And she said, that'd be great. Not only can you do that, I'll help you put together the first advisory board. So that first advisory board included people like Marion Campbell and Albert Schweitzer and Albert Einstein. So I'm sorry to our board members that are here. <laughs> So Roosevelt needed a building. So they purchased the auditorium building from the city of Chicago for, I think, and it's, there's been a lot of numbers, but Lynn Weiner's sitting right there, $420,000 plus back taxes? Something like, that. Something like that. And they started Roosevelt University. They took over the office tower and the hotel rooms and made them into classrooms and um, offices, but they didn't have the funding at the time to restore the theater. So the theater actually remained dormant from 1946 until 1963, when Roosevelt trustee Beatrice Spatchner uh, stood up and said she'd like to renovate the auditorium theater. So she raised the funds along with the help of many others. She, she gets all the credit, but I'm sure she didn't do it by herself. And, oh, do we have applause for Beatrice? It's really amazing when you think about it, because if you think about the early 1960s, those of us that are old enough to have been alive, um, that's when they were tearing down old buildings and building new big block ugly buildings. So the fact that she did this is amazing. Anyway, the theater reopened on October 30th, 1967 
with a performance by the New York City Ballet featuring Edward Vallella. And it was another grand, grand night in the history of the Auditorium Theater. Um, moving along, uh, the Auditorium immediately became known for dance with this type of production. Um, we also were very happy that the um, Joffrey Ballet was part of our very first season after the reopening in 1968. And Alvin Ailey were part of the uh, second season in 1969. So you all know that we have these relationships yet today. They started all the way back in 1968 and 69. After opening, the auditorium became known as the Rock and Roll Palace of Chicago. And everybody who was anyone played at the auditorium. I'm not going to name all these names because you can read. But um, the auditorium was the perfect venue at the time because it was before they started building arenas and 12 and 20,000 seat uh, spaces for rock and roll. So our 4,000 seat seats lent itself perfectly to be the rock and roll venue of Chicago. We do still do, we do still do, we still do rock and roll today, even though our primary focus seems to be on dance recently. Um, and then in the 1980s, a, a different twist happened at the auditorium, and we became known and became the home of the large blockbuster Broadway musicals. So we had Les Mis, we had Phantom of the Opera, we had Showboat. So if you grew up in Chicago in the 60s and 70s, and someone mentions the auditorium, you can say, oh, I remember going to the Who. But if you ask someone who grew up in the 80s and early 90s, they'll say, oh, I remember seeing Les Mis or Phantom at the Auditorium Theater. Then, when the Joffrey moved to Chicago in 1995, they became the Auditorium's resident ballet company. And that ended the whole uh, calendar availability to put those long blockbuster shows in. So we've been very happy to have uh, the Joffrey since 1995 as our resident company. And we continue to do um, other dance as well. We still do Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. They performed there um, more than any other company except the Joffrey since opening. And other companies of international renown. Um, with the uh, demise of the large Broadway blockbusters, the auditorium didn't want to be totally out of the Broadway scene. So in 2003, we made an uh, agreement with our good friends from Broadway in Chicago and became a Broadway in Chicago house for Broadway shows. And uh, these are some of the shows that uh, we've had since that 2003 uh, arrangement was made. And it's been a, a terrific partnership. They're sitting right down here in front of me. So I got to make sure I tell everybody how great Broadway in Chicago is. But we've had some great shows, and it's been a great partnership. Uh, we also continue to do music. We do a lot of local music as well as the big rock stars. So we uh, become a, a kind of launching pad for Orbert Davis and his Chicago Jazz Philharmonic. And we're supporting other Chicago artists, as you'll see here. Our annual production of Too Hot to Handle is done every um, Martin Luther King holiday uh, weekend. So it's coming up in January. It's a terrific, terrific um, jazz gospel version of Handel's Messiah. So if you haven't seen it, be there in January. Um, moving on, we also uh, are home every Sunday morning to Willow, Chicago. So I just, I just need to pause here a moment and say what really sep separates the auditorium programmatically from other theaters in the loop is that we do a little bit of everything. Uh, most of the other loop theaters are focused on <laughs> presenting one type of product, Broadway or concerts or um, resident theater like the Goodman. We do a little bit of everything. So in a given week at the auditorium, um, you can see uh, a major international dance company. You can see a rock concert. You can attend an educational program. And on Sunday morning, you can even go to church. Uh, we also have a very strong educational program. This is uh, uh, Most of these pictures are from our uh, summer arts camp for children who have experienced the death of a parent, Hands Together Art to Art, now in its 10th year. We've put over 900 kids through this program. And it's been extremely rewarding and extremely um, valuable to the auditorium. So that's my 10 minutes to tell you a little bit about what we're doing in the building. And now I'm going to bring up uh, Blair Kamen, and he's going to tell you about the building itself.
Thanks, Brett. Um, can you all hear me okay? Okay. Well, um, thank you so much for inviting me to be at the City Club. It's great to be here with Brett and Rick. Um, you know, asking me to do the auditorium building in 10 minutes is kind of like asking Donald Trump to exercise restraint in putting up signs <laughs> in his building on the Chicago River. Um, one of the light motifs today is going to be New York bad, Chicago good. So I, I yes, uh, I, I figure that would uh, strike a chord. You know, it's, it's really fantastic to be here and um, I am particularly pleased that um, my rabbi, Sam Gordon, was able to give the invocation today. Um, I take full responsibility for that, and now when, you know, when I'm on my way to heaven, I know Sam is going to clout me in. Um, okay. So um, Brett talked wonderfully about um, the music, uh, musical performances at the auditorium. And architecture, as many of you know, I think is often referred to as frozen music. Um, and so what I'd like to talk about today is the architecture of the auditorium and this great building where Chicago found its architectural voice. So um, the story starts really with um, Ferdinand Peck, uh, who you see on the left here. He is a philanthropist, uh, an opera lover, and as Brett told you, he wanted to um, create a setting for opera that would be subsidized by an office and a hotel. But Peck also had social aims, which I'm representing here with a Haymarket incident of 1886. As you all know, there was tremendous tension between labor and management in Chicago. And as Paul told you, um, I am not an architectural activist, but an anarchist. And so I, of course, you know, have great sympathies with the anarchists who threw the bomb. And no, I'm just kidding. Um, but Peck's idea was a, uh, to create a, an opera house that would bring members of all classes together. Uh, some, perhaps naively, he thought that that would solve the tensions between labor and management. Um, he hired uh, great architects, uh, Louis Sullivan, who you see on the right, and Dankmar Adler, who you see top left. Uh, and of course, their um, legacy in Chicago has, uh, in many cases, been destroyed. One example of that is the, um, the uh, Chicago Stock Exchange uh, trading hall, which you see at the Art Institute, the auditorium is even more special in a way because it's one of the few remaining buildings uh, that we really can really see their legacy. So interestingly enough, um, the auditorium's uh, first plan does not look entirely like the building you see today. Um, you can see the plan on the left. Um, it's very Victorian, very ornate, and if some of you who know the Plaza Hotel in New York City, which I'm showing you on the right, can see the similarities. A very busy roof line with a gable, dormer windows, a tower. And the idea here was that Sullivan and Adler were projecting the image of a grand hotel, like, like the one you see in, in New York. What happened to change this design was this great building, the Marshall Field Wholesale Store, by the great architect, Henry Hobson Richardson, who you see on the right, wearing monk's robes. Now you're probably wondering, why the hell is Henry Hobson Richardson, who also designed Glessner House, um, why is he wearing monk's robes? And Richardson had a monkish life. His friends kidded him about being a monk, so to get back at them, he posed in, in these brown monk's robes. But it's often said that architects' um, fashions are then translated into their buildings. And I think you can see that here in some ways. I mean, look at the field wholesale store. It's this, like Richardson, who weighed about 350 pounds. It's a very heavyweight, blocky building. It has these beautiful Roman arches. And this style is actually called Richardsonian Romanesque. So you can see how it influenced Adler and Sullivan. They go away from that initial, very busy, Victorian, ornate plaza hotel scheme. And what they do is they emerge with this very majestic, simple, dignified building um, whose arches and massive simplicity really are very much influenced by um, Richardson's whole, wholesale store of Marshall Field. 
Now, the building is significant not only as a structure in and of itself, but also in an urbanistic sense. It, it helps to shape what we call the Michigan Avenue cliff. And this is this continuous stone wall from Randolph to Roosevelt uh, that's cut as though by a meat ax, creating this giant cliff of stone uh, facing Grand Park. Now, we don't think about this a lot today, but the image that the Michigan Avenue cliff projects is one of indestructibility, massive stone-like buildings. And when you consider that the auditorium was built only 18 years after the fire, when the city was incinerated and fragile, that image really, I think, uh, took hold and helped to form uh, the rest of the Michigan Avenue cliff. Here's a, the floor plan of the building. You can see um, the um, theater right there that I'm pointing is wrapped by the hotel on Michigan Avenue and the office building along Wabash and Congress. So it's very much this um, kind of Fabergé egg scheme with the, uh, the theater being in the middle and economically supported, at least in theory, um, by the, uh, the other uses. Now, here's where it really gets interesting. This is the cross section of the building. And you can see here um, the major uses. This is the theater. Um, on top of it, which I'm gonna show you in a second, was an architectural afterthought, a banquet hall, now called Gans Hall, that was literally built in a, on, like a bridge after the initial construction was, uh, was done. Um, here's Roosevelt's library with arched ceilings that recall those in the theater. And then I'm also gonna talk about the, uh, the foundations. This building, uh, in the Richardsonian manner of being a heavyweight, weighed 110,000 tons. It was the heaviest building in the world at the time of its completion, really required very heavy foundations to maintain it. So there's Gans Hall. This is the, um, the banquet hall that you see here initially, and it's been beautifully restored um, by architect Larry Booth of Chicago with these fabulous uh, chandeliers, and it's now a recital hall for, uh, for Roosevelt. Here's the library, um, which where you can see, this was the dining room for uh, Roosevelt. It's now the library for, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, uh, this was the main dining room for the Auditorium Hotel, and it's now the, uh, the uh, library for Roosevelt. Next slide. And here you can see the foundations, very complex, a, uh, a mix of steel rails, uh, steel bars, rubble uh, mounted into uh, pyramid shapes, supporting this massive uh, building. Now, this gets back to the leitmotif of New York versus Chicago that I know, all know you're so interested in. This is a typical opera house. This is New York, the Metropolitan, and you can see that it's uh, a typical opera house uh, with tiers arranged around, uh, ringed around um, uh, the audience. And the whole point here is for the, the rich to sit in the boxes, to spend lots of money, and to show off their jewels and finery. Now, remember, Peck uh, wanted something different. So in the auditorium, it is an entirely different plan. The uh, boxes are pushed to the side of the hall, over here on the side. And the best seats are in the middle uh, for uh, the regular people. As, and these seats, of course, up high are also very good in the balconies. You can see how um, Adler and Sullivan did a masterful job of uniting acoustics and architecture. Um, the four great arches that um, go over the, uh, the audience are, are like a, um, a, um, oh gosh, a megaphone. And they direct sound down, and um, that is one of the reasons why the auditorium has such splendid acoustics, that Adler and Sullivan weren't just doing these arches for aesthetic reasons, but for acoustic reasons as well. Um, you can see that, as Mies van der Rohe said, God is in the details, and you can see that um, here. Um, instead of using a chandelier, uh, as they did in Paris in the slide I'm showing you on the right. Uh, they lit the arches with electric light bulbs, which were very modern and newfangled at the time. So they were dramatizing the modernity of the theater. 
in addition, the palette, as you can see, is not gold. It is gold, a beautiful gold that uh, is in everything from the covering for the organ to the arches, as opposed to red. And it's interesting that red in those years, of course, uh, had had um, associations with socialism and labor. So they kind of went neutral on that and did gold instead of red. Uh, a few more details that I'd like to show you. The arches uh, were done in, Sol in Sullivan's distinctive uh, na nature-inspired ornament, the same kind that you see uh, at the great Carson Perry Scott store. So this is really an example of how he made this building specifically attuned to Chicago in the Midwest and thus to America. It was not a European opera house, uh, a copy of a European opera house. It was really an American building. Oh, okay, thank you. And just as part of the experience, of course, you can see uh, tremendous uh, architecture, not only in the grand view of the hall, but also in the uh, circulation spaces uh, that lead to the seats and in the seats themselves. Just a, a, like a cliff-like uh, proximity and intimacy that really makes this a great performance space. Brett's already told you about the campaigns to preserve, so I'm not gonna dwell on that. Why don't we go to the last slide? I just want to talk about the last couple of slides. I just want to talk about the legacy. As Brett has mentioned, this is where Chicago really began to think big and to take a place on the world stage. So we see the legacy for the auditorium in the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893. We see it in mixed use buildings like the auditorium, like the John Hancock Center. Last slide. And we see it in Millennium Park, in the, the notion that Chicago is a place that invents the urban future. Doesn't copy the past, but invents the urban future. Last slide. So I just want to say that in conclusion, this is really an incredible building, uh, and <coughs> one that I hope we never take for granted. It's a masterwork of architecture and engineering. It's a civic monument. And the question going forward really is, can we continue to preserve it? Because there are many areas in the building that still need preservation. And can we live up to its legacy? Many of you are in the political class. You build park district buildings or school buildings or other buildings. And Peck, Adler, and Sullivan did not obviously settle for mediocrity. They created a great building that we are celebrating 125 years later, one that set the tone for what Chicago is. So the challenge really going forward is to remember this greatness and to build on it rather than just making it a relic from the past. Thank you. Well, I am, I am nowhere near as smart as these two, so I have notes here. And I, I do not have recall of every single thing, perhaps because I spent way too much time in the 60s seeing rock shows at. <laughs> Jim Morrison rolling around in a microphone cord on the stage of the auditorium theater is something I can never forget every time I walk into the auditorium theater. I have no uh, slideshow either. A building is not, of course, as you know, a living thing, but the auditorium building was born, as you've heard, on December 9th, 1889, with a glittering night, 5,000 notable, whatever that means, Chicagoans, and Adelina Patty singing a song, many songs. One of them was called Home Sweet Home. And not far away, on the near west side, where home was anything but sweet, another new building that opened that same year was in full operation with a far less glitzy crowd. Hull House was born in December 1889, when Jane Addams and Helen Gates rented rooms in a dilapidated mansion near Halstead and Polk. The lady's aim was to render humanitarian and civic service to the poor in the surrounding slums. And there were a lot of poor in a lot of slums. They did many things. They bathed babies who couldn't otherwise be bathed. They taught crafts. They solved domestic problems. There were problems aplenty in this city then, and damn it, still today. Those post-Great Fire years brought violations of building safety ordinances, the rise of criminality, financial conflict, 
in conflicts between workers seeking better wages, as Blair alluded to, in conditions, and stubborn industrialists fighting what they consider these radical, radical demands, such as an eight-hour day. But the city kept a frenetic pace, continuing to thrive and expand its status as the nation's major center for shipment of grain, for livestock, for lumber. When the auditorium opened, and please remember that the city is light and dark, always good and bad, a couple of sisters, Mina and Ada Everly, were putting the finishing touches on a place not far to the south. They would call it the Everly Club, and it would become the most famous whorehouse in the world. It was $50 simply to walk in the door. You have to pay more for the many and varied diversions inside. The city was a place of dreamers and bandits, those of low morals and high aesthetics. We had the awesomely wealthy living side by side with the heartbreakingly poor. There was the blood-drenched daily violence of the stockyards and the swan boats that floated gently in the Lincoln Park Lagoon. The facts, the Census Bureau put our population at 1.5 million, give or take. But if you were to go back in time and stand at the corner of, I don't know, Dearborn and Madison, you'd say the census takers were insane. There had to be more people, millions more. It was as if all of humanity, as well as an incalculable number of horses and carts and bicycles had crowded inside the city's limits. More than one-third of us then were foreign-born. 98% of us were white, and the other races represented were 30,000 blacks, 1,200 Chinese, 68 Japanese, and eight Indians. There were many who would make their mark here, many of those people, and a few would make marks of a lasting sort. As Blair knows so well and articulates so beautifully in his pieces, these people were young architects who, in the wake of the fire, were ready to experiment in bold new ways. And the mid 80s, 1880s, gave Chicago's great architectural age its birth. Blair may disagree, but I think it was touched off by William LeBaron Jenny, who designed the world's first skyscraper in 1884, the home insurance building at LaSalle and Monroe, 10 stories high. That building fell in 1931, the Everly Club long before that, the stockyards eventually too. And I just wonder, you know, we're talking about the Great Fire, one of my favorite stories, my father was a young kid working at City News, and he covered in 1934, May 27, 1934, the second largest fire in the history of Chicago. It took out 90% of the stockyards, it killed 21 firemen, it killed 125 cows, and as my father told me a million times, he was covering it for City News, writing notes, standing across the street, he's interviewing one guy standing there, says, what do you think? What do you think? And the guy says, them cows, they had it coming. <laughs> <laughs> Buildings come and go and we barely notice, but the city always carries on, it always has. As I said, a building is not, of course, a living thing. People walk past the Tribune Tower all the time without noticing as Blair has so beautifully captured in a little booklet, they still have that booklet? The 150 some pieces of famous structures and historical sites around the planet, the Alamo, the Great Wall of China that are embedded into the building. This is another thing Blair taught me. People rush in and out of the Disney store. You know, all know where the Disney store is? They don't bother to count the 170 or so pairs of mouse ears that cover the exterior, which Blair called at one point a slick homage to Louis Sullivan. <laughs> slick indeed. People shop the mall stores at Belmont and Western without 
hearing the echoes of the bobs, the flying turns, or any of the other wonders of what was Riverview. Still, things remain, and without trying to, the city hides from us some of its greatest pleasures. Just a few weeks ago, I was having lunch with a couple, a couple I've known forever at the Atwood Cafe in the Burnham Hotel, and we were talking about how, they were talking mostly about how beautiful it was, and one of them asked me, how recently did this go up? I said, well, uh, 1895 is when the <laughs> building was built, and it was called Reliance Building. It had fallen a really lousy shape in the mid-30s. It got $30 million and renovated and renewed it to its glory, and here it is, and suddenly they remembered that. Being lifelong Chicagoans, they were understandably a bit embarrassed, and my friend said, it's funny, funny what you forget, what you don't see. I'll never stop being amazed by this city. Chicago can be a city at once familiar and unexpected. And so we do our part to celebrate what remains. The auditorium, I find a portrait in endurance prevailing over time and circumstances and also a welcome reminder in a turbulent time that not everything goes up in smoke or tumbles into rubble. Yeah, the auditorium is not a living thing, but in so many ways, it is the lifeblood of this city, its beating heart, its soul, that it remains so active and so lovely gives me hope. Well, I want to apologize. We should have had three better speakers. I mean, you know, they <laughs> mumbling and, you know, and uh, his dad and uh, Lloyd went, wrote the two books. Mr. Mays and I will agree, Lords of the Levy and Big Bill, the Bu was Big Bill the Builder, Thompson? Just Big Bill of Chicago. Big Bill of Chicago. That Ed and I have stolen many ideas from, uh, what proper, proper. Of uh, from. So if we have any questions, uh, by the way, that story about your dad is outstanding. Uh, any questions at all? I <laughs> tell this is not going to be the easiest three people to ask anything, but I know the Roosevelt table is, is mute. Uh, we don't want to discuss that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Doherty uh, asked who was the university named after. Let's just simply say that there is still some discussion. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. I still got to work there, Jay. Now, come on, give me a... It, it was Franklin, but Eleanor, thank you. No, it was, it's Franklin, but... Uh, Eleanor was very important, and if I really had courage, I, what? I know that, I know that, I know that. Well, since you said that, I'll say it again then. If there was no Eleanor, there'd be no Roosevelt University. If there was a Franklin, you know, it's, Franklin is the, is the person, reason there's a university. Eleanor is crucial to its advancement, but we, we, we admire both incredibly equally well. <laughs> Mush, did I cover myself? <laughs> Jay, lousy question. All right. From, from Lawndale Avenue in the old days, Marge, where are you? Marge Collins, formerly Marge Tepper, lived three doors down from me. Please tell us, who's this to? Why Congress Street was widened and what that had <laughs> effect on the building. Larry, you want to handle that? Yeah, Congress was widened um, to make way, uh, to become a feeder road for the, uh, for the Ike. And that's the impact that had on the building was that the, um, the arcade that you see now along um, Congress was hollowed out. It wasn't there originally, and some great spaces were lost. There was a bar. Wait, Kogan, there was a bar there. You know. <laughs> One of the <laughs> One of the greatest bars in Chicago history. Exactly. Did you ever? No. You never? That, that, is that the only? Wait, is that a record? The only place? The only bar that you never? 
Anyway, that, so, <laughs> so a, a very, a, I mean, a place of enormous importance. Not only was it a Louis Sullivan and Dankmar Adler design bar, but a bar that Rick Hogan had never drank at. So, I mean, a huge loss, and that's, that's why it was. Uh, it's a huge loss for the receipts of that bar. <laughs> there you go. Bar could have helped fund a lot of stuff. Um, any other question? City Club A, City Club P, anyone else? Well, Mush, you don't have to write it out because you're Mush. Go ahead. Well, the, the front, okay. And the question is, where is the front of the building? In, uh, it's a fair question. Yeah. It's a three-fronted building, uh, which is in part <laughs> why. But the main front, I would say, is on Michigan Avenue. That's, that was the hotel entrance, and that's where the three grand arches are. Um, this, this, the secondary entrance, I would say, is the entrance to the theater. And interestingly enough, the uh, architecture critic Montgomery Schuyler the leading architecture critic of the day, criticized that entrance as being one of the faults. He felt that the arches were too huddled and bunched and should have been more simple and grand, uh, like the one on, um, uh, on Michigan. The, the tertiary entrance, as it were, was for the office building, and that, of course, uh, was on uh, Wabash. OK, how about a big round of applause? Oh, wait, 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 one more question. Hold it. Hold it, hold it. We have the famous tour guide of Chicago, Mr. Mazur, yes? Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, is it true that there was an underground passage between the Congress Hotel and the auditorium uh, during the Opera House years so that singers could have their throats exposed oh, that's to interesting. Chicago's in front that's of weather? The question is, was there an underground passage between the auditorium theater and the Pitt Congress Hotel? There, there was certainly an underground tunnel. Uh, the Congress Hotel was built uh, as they started building these hotels with private washrooms. The, the same owners, there was a shared ownership. This is the first time I've heard about the opera singers having a way to avoid the weather, so we'll have to find out about that. Thank you. I've heard a much more tawdry explanation, which yes, I am I have to reveal. <laughs> I have to. <laughs> all, the, all the big brass is here, and I'm already in trouble. All right. I will now answer. Can you hear me? No. Use, use Blair's mic. He can share. Tribune. <laughs> Since there aren't a lot of uh, questions, I'll answer a question that all of you are afraid to ask. Yes, I was high at the Doors concert. <laughs> uh, Charlie Gardner, one of our trustees, asked that question, but I was too much of a gentleman to bring it up. But uh, now we got that. Pardon the expression, cleared up. How about a big round of applause? This is tremendous.